Well, the news yesterday was heartbreaking that six young hostages were executed by Hamas. But where has the outrage been about the fact that there are still over 100 hostages being held captive by terrorists in tunnels in Gaza? Or we hear are constant calls for an immediate ceasefire. There's outright bias from most of the left-wing media. And it's something my next guest faced daily when he worked as Israel's government spokesman. I was speaking to a hostage negotiator this morning. He made the comparison between the 50 hostages, hostages that Hamas has promised, um, promised to release as opposed to the 150 prisoners that are Palestinians that Israel has said that it will release. And he made the comp comparison between the numbers and the fact that does Israel not think that Palestinian lives are valued as highly as Israeli lives? That is an astonishing accusation. If we could release one prisoner for every one hostage, we would obviously do that. We're operating in horrific circumstances. We're not choosing to release these prisoners who have blood on their hands. We and I spoke exclusively about media bias and more with the highly impressive Elon Levy. Elon Levy, great to have you with us. It's good to be here in Australia. Now, you rose to fame globally because you had the courage to take on left-leaning media hosts who were clearly misrepresenting Israel's position. This was right at the start of the war, right after the October 7 attacks. What did you think of this media bias that was just so blatant? I think it's tragic to see where media bias has led Western countries like Australia. Australia understood when Hamas declared this war that Israel needs to win. People forget this. Australia was gunning for an Israeli victory. The Australian leadership said together with Canada and New Zealand it wants a ceasefire, but a ceasefire in which Hamas lays down its arms and releases all the hostages. Australia was very clear back in December that can be no role for Hamas in the future of Gaza. And I think over time we've seen media so eager to replicate Hamas figures, accept Hamas claims without any scrutiny, in a way that has soured and poisoned public opinion against Israel and brought us to this position where there is immense international pressure on Israel to leave Hamas on its feet, where we know that leaving Hamas on its feet simply starts the clock ticking towards the next war. Because after the October 7th massacre, Hamas promised it would do it again and again, and Israel vowed that there would be never again. And that's what's at stake in this war. And that's why it's so important when people consume their media to be really critical about the information coming out of Hamas-run Gaza, because Hamas has a deliberate strategy, a deliberate strategy of trying to generate human suffering inside Gaza. It's a sick strategy to try to generate pressure on Israel, to leave it on its feet after the war that it started, mm. and that horrific massacre on October 7th. I mean, we hear media outlets and governments around the world say um, Hamas can have no future role in the governing of Gaza, as you just said. But at the same time, more and more, they're calling for an immediate ceasefire, often an unconditional ceasefire, but an immediate ceasefire. So how do they think Hamas is actually going to be removed as the governing body if there is an immediate ceasefire? I don't know how governments expect Hamas to be removed from power unless Israel removes it from power. Australia back in December said there must be a ceasefire. It can't be unilateral. Hamas must lay down its arms. Hamas then ignored the government of Australia, continued to fight Israel, continued to hold and rape and abuse and starve and torture and execute hostages. And Israel said we have no choice but to fight to bring down Hamas and to bring back the hostages because it doesn't care what Australia and other governments are saying. Uh, in Israel, we want this war to go away, much like the rest of the world, but we understand that we don't have a magic wand and cannot make Hamas go away. If this war ends with Hamas in power and hostages in Gaza, there will be a next time. It will be worse. And it will be worse because the Hamas army of terror will be convinced that the world will save it from the wars that it started. And by the way, this isn't just a question about Hamas. It's a question about the Iranian regime as mm. well, which is attacking Israel through its proxy armies on seven fronts. It's a question about Russia and China and other countries that are challenging the Western order and countries like Australia. They are looking at the Western world and asking, do they have the courage of their convictions to stand by their allies and do what they need for their security? Or are they going to allow themselves to be manipulated by terrorist propaganda into leaving these terrorist armies on their feet after those horrific atrocities? Do you think Hamas can be defeated? ISIS was defeated. It was removed from power. People say Hamas is an idea. Well, ISIS is still an idea. 
But look, ISIS is trying to pull off terror attacks in Austria. It no longer controls territory the size of Austria. Hamas is a terrorist regime. It's a terrorist regime that spent 16 years in power mm. since Israel withdrew in 2005, deliberately building a network of tunnels 10 times longer than the Sydney Metro, underneath people's homes and schools and hospitals. Thanks to billions of dollars in international aid. Exactly. Billions of dollars of international aid. And the concrete didn't go to people's houses. It went to tunnels underneath people's houses. Aid that went through organizations like UNRWA, to which Australia has doubled its commitment and has been covering up how Hamas has been stealing aid and allowing it to operate from inside its facilities. That, that cannot go on. The Albanese government actually recommitted funding to UNRWA without even waiting for the official investigation to be complete. And the official investigation found that at least nine members of UNRWA took part in the October 7th massacre. We have hostages who came back from Gaza and say that they were held in the homes of UNRWA teachers. Now, the problem goes so much deeper than simply UNRWA staff members taking part in the October 7th massacre. Most of the terrorists who took part in that massacre were UNRWA graduates, graduates of its school system. Most of the terrorists who took part in October 7th were recipients of UNRWA aid. It's the fact that UNRWA gives welfare to people in Gaza that gives them the financial security they need to focus on terrorism. And it's an organization that lets Hamas fight out of its schools and then covers it up, that lets Hamas steal aid and covers it up. And Australian taxpayers need to understand that funding for UNRWA is a direct subsidy to Hamas's army of terror. And that money is winding up in the coffers of Hamas. Do you think Australian government should immediately stop funding UNRWA? I think the Australian government and all governments should stop funding UNRWA. This is an organisation that exists not to solve our conflict with the Palestinians, but to perpetuate it. Mm. Because UNRWA tells the Palestinians to reject the existence of Israel in any borders whatsoever. It tells them that Israel is illegitimate, that they have a right to resist it. And that fuels future conflict. And we need to bring this conflict to a close and not fuel and finance the Palestinians' forever war against the state of Israel. And that is exactly what UNRWA is doing with Australian taxpayer money. The United Nations has also failed in its various bodies to visit any of the hostages who have, some of them, now been, it'll, well, in October, it'll be a year in captivity. No visits from any UN agencies, no visits from the Red Cross. What do you think about this? It's worse than the fact that the Red Cross hasn't visited the hostages. These UN agencies haven't shown a modicum of sympathy for the hostages. There are still two child hostages in Gaza. Kfir and Ariel Bibas. Kfir Bibas is a baby. He just turned one a few months ago. If there were any sympathy, you would expect organizations like UNICEF to be pushing out his image, raising global awareness about it, but there's absolute silence. I know the hostages' families gave up a long time ago on trying to pressure the Red Cross to visit those families. Mm. Unfortunately, we have too many of these UN agencies that are pushing the Palestinian narrative and have found themselves completely incapable of showing any sympathy for the Israeli victims of the October 7th massacre or indeed the hostages. Let's remember, it's been mm. nearly a year. There are still 107 hostages. Around 35 of them we know have been killed, executed in the terror dungeons. And the others we fear are being starved and tortured and raped and executed. And according to recent reports, being held around Yihya Sinwar himself, the leader of Hamas, in a horrible tunnel somewhere to be used as human shields. Literally, the hostages trying to protect him, and, and we've heard reports that he's trying to say that there'll be no return of hostages if he is not alive. So he's putting his own personal life front and centre while not caring about the Palestinians. People even. want this war to end, and Hamas does not want this war to end. Hamas wants this war to continue because the human suffering inside Gaza is good for it because it's poisoning public opinion against Israel. That is what Hamas wants. Now, Yehia Sinwa, Hamas's warlord in Gaza, is reportedly mm. demanding personal guarantees for his safety. I spoke to a hostage family this week. They asked me, what are the guarantees for my safety? We want to bring the hostages home, which means we want to bring them home so they can sleep safely in the beds from which they were abducted on October 7th. What are our guarantees? that they are going to be safe. And they say we want the hostages home, but also the Hamas terror regime can no longer be our neighbor. Because we know that if we're forced to live next to Hamas, it is only a matter of time until it attacks us again and does another October 7th or tries to do it, just as it has been promising to do every day since that day when it committed those awful acts of burning families alive and those acts of gang rape. Mm. You mentioned baby Kafir and his brother Ariel. What hope do you have that they are still alive? Hamas claims that they are dead, 
but we don't know that for a fact. They released a sick propaganda video, by the way, in which they told their father, who is also a hostage, that his children had been killed, just to watch him break down. And I don't want to imagine what a horrible mental condition that poor man is in. But until we know otherwise, we have to assume that those two children are alive and that right now, in a tunnel, somewhere in Gaza, is a baby and his five-year-old brother and their mother, and they are scared for their lives. And, and, and little Kfir Bibas has been a hostage for longer than he was ever free. And how this is not the first thing that people think about when they wake up in the world right now. Mm. Look, you have UNICEF right now talking about a polio campaign inside Gaza to vaccinate children. What are their plans to vaccinate Kfir and Ariel Bibas? Those are the two most vulnerable, at-risk children in Gaza right now. And that is why Israel doesn't have the luxury of simply wrapping this up and saying, let's pull back and let it be. Mm. There are 107 hostages there, including two children, and Israel has to keep fighting to put pressure on Hamas to let them out. And we need pressure from Australia on Hamas and on its backers, on Qatar, Turkey and Iran, to let them go now. Well, you, you hear more frequent uh, criticism from the Australian government, from the Albanese government of Israel, rather than you do for them calling for the release of the hostages. It's often an afterthought or included in commentary rather than the main demand from our government. Look, a big political issue in Australia over the past few weeks, it has been the centre of debate in our parliament, has been over the Australian government issuing nearly 3,000 visas to Palestinians coming out of Gaza. Uh, what would be the concern, from your perspective, of bringing in, from a terrorist-controlled war zone, thousands of people, and I should mention they're coming in on visitor visas, so often without adequate security checks? I understand the very noble impulse to want to give a safe haven and a refuge for people fleeing a war zone, but Australians need to be aware that Gaza has a very deep extremism problem. Polls still show that a majority of Gazans think that the October 7th massacre was the correct decision by their government, Hamas, despite everything that has happened since. A poll by the Doha Institute of Palestinians in the West Bank asked them whether they thought the October 7th massacre was legitimate or illegitimate. 0% said that it was illegitimate. Unfortunately, within Gaza, there is widespread support for the barbaric atrocities unleashed on Israeli civilians on October 7th. And if Australia does want to take in refugees, it has to make sure that it has in place a very firm de-radicalization program to if assimilate that's even these possible. people. If it is possible to, to, to help wean them off the radical ideology that they were taught by Hamas and by UN schools as well, through UNRWA funding, mm. that has taught them to despise the state of Israel, that has ingrained them with deep anti-Semitism, deeply, deeply ingrained in Gaza, noble impulse to take in refugees, but you cannot simply pretend that the extremism problem and the support for jihad and Islamic terrorism doesn't exist. Yeah, they're just turning a blind eye to all of this and putting humanitarian concerns above national security, which is a, a huge problem. Elon Levy, terrific to have you in Australia. Great to meet you in person. Good to be Thank here. You Thank you so Sarah. much.